Handling for, for, for Heidegger is a relation of care and concern for dealings, not a relation where the world is set before us knowing human subjects as an object of knowledge. And so we come back to, to the old lectern. It is not an object of, of knowledge. It is something, it is a relationship of care and concern for dealings. I have to be very nice to it or else it won't do the things that I need it to do for me in this case. For Heidegger, the drama of existence is orientated around the possibilities that being in the world throws up. And so we, that idea of being in the world that's hyphenated, being in the world, not a kind of separate being in the world, but being hyphen in the world, each hyphen. That we're not separate from it. Our being is being in the world. So for Heidegger, the drama of human existence is orientated around the possibilities that being in the world throws up. In his phenomenology, the world is not the objective world of things and places, but rather the world is that into which we are thrown. Heidegger uses the term Dasein for the fundamental fact of being right there that characterises being thrown in the middle of things. And sometimes I think, God, wouldn't it be nice just to be able to hop off? But we can never just hop off. We're always there in the middle of things. Um, being in the middle of things, he claims, we don't come to understand the world by contemplating it theoretically, nor do we know it, nor do we know it objectively. So we don't, know, we don't know it by contemplating it theoretically, nor do we know it objectively. Rather, it is being in the middle of things, putting things to use, and handling of things that we come to understand our world. Thus, the world is discovered through our involvement with or handling of it. Our involvement or relationship with the world underpins the primarily practical nature of being in the world. Thus, it is through dealings or handling entities in the world that the nature of the world is revealed to us. Now, in our everyday experience of the world, we would understand this, and you might be saying, well, what makes art any different than, you know, than everyday life. So in our everyday being in the world is concerned with handling or dealing with things, in the, it was the handling things, whether it is tools, emotions, ideas or other beings. So this idea of handling isn't just sort of things like books and this. And we, we handle our ideas. It was interesting, it wasn't until I handled Heidegger's ideas, I had to handle them and keep handling them, that I could start to understand anything about the complexity of them. So we understand, for example, that children learn to ride a bike by riding it, not being by told how to ride a bike. Similarly, the manual on road rules that we are required to read before we're sitting our driving test does not help us to drive a car any better. And it is not until we negotiate the road rules in practice rather than in this little manual that they actually begin to make practical sense. We also may understand the folly of trying to Trying, uh, of trying to follow instruction manuals. If, if you're anybody's like me, you go to Ikea, you come home with a, with a box and some instructions and you look at it totally incommoded because the, the, uh, the, the instructions never quite fit uh, and you then have to kind of work and gradually nut it out in the handling of it. So, uh, the, so we... That, the flat pack, the woes of negotiating the vagaries of man manuals are just uh, are beyond me, certainly. It proves no substitute for trial and error or doing it. In educational circles, we tend to call this experiential learning. I don't think, you know, for educators amongst them, I don't think that's anything unfamiliar. So I come back to my question. How is art, that is the handling of materials and ideas to produce artworks or performance, any different from our everyday dealings in the world? And some people would say they come very close. You know, exhibitions like the Sydney Biennale, the everyday, you know, sometimes it comes very, very close. So what then makes the difference? Heidegger suggests that in our everyday handling of things, we tend to act out of habit and forget to notice what things are in themselves. In our habitual activities, everything falls into inconspicuousness and our use of things becomes a means to end in order to achieve goals. And here we, objects and entities come to exist in order to. And of course, those of you who are familiar with the question concerning technology, this, uh, this, uh, the essay, whole, the whole concern of that essay is a concern about how in an instrumentalist world we use things in order to, whether they are resources, 
other people or whatever. We're always using things in order to. So, thus we will, and this objects and entities come to exist in order to. Thus we will use a car, public transport, or fly in a plane to get from point A to B, never stopping at marvelling at just what it is that is happening here. We may use a software package to make an image or a video, not even giving a thought to its being. When we use our mobile phone, we forget, if we, if we ever knew, the wonder of the first telephone transmission and what that in itself means. We just tend to use things. And that's, uh, as a teacher of art, my whole, uh, the interesting is st- kind of saying to questions, uh, saying to my students, don't just use things. You know, these are not just things for your use because you're a human being. Uh, and so that very much, for him, the concern that we just use things. The tool or a piece of equipment gets lost or becomes inconspicuous in use. And so he says that in use, we just use it. We, we never, we don't think about what its being is as this being of this pilot, whiteboard market is as uh, its being. We just use it. For our Heidegger, the privileged place of art arises from its capacity to create a clearing, a space where we once again notice what entities are in themselves. He suggests that in and through art, we are forced to reconsider the relations that occur in the process or tissue of making life. A handling of and dealings with entities in practice offers a special form of insight. This type of thinking through practice has come to be known in the the area that I'm working in as material thinking. But I think it's got a nice link back to Heidegger's uh, practical understanding. So, the tool analysis. The foundations for material or practical thinking can be found in Heidegger's tool analysis, which is in Being and Time. Here Heidegger examines the particular form of knowledge that arises from our handling of materials and processes. His model of how the world is already discovered through our use of a piece of equipment, the equip- he terms that equipmentality, is orientated around a constellation of practical terms. For Heidegger, the primary dealings that we have in, with the world are those things that we put to use. And I just want to stop for a minute and, and ask you to think about that when he says the primary things, um, dealings, the primary dealings that we have in the world are those things that we put to use. And he says, and I quote, the kind of dealing which is closest to us is not bare perceptual co- cognition, but a kind of concern. And so we have this notion of concern and concernful dealings, uh, which manipulates things and puts them to use. Such entities are not there by objects for knowing the world, theoretically. They are simply what gets used, what's produced, and so forth. In his distinction, uh in his distinction, uh, right, in his distinction between theoretical knowledge and use, Heidegger identifies two different ways that we encounter what the tool. So we're talking about his tool analysis. And he, he, he identifies two different ways that we en- encounter what tools are in themselves. When we handle or deal with tools, and we, again, we're talking about, I'm talking about a fairly classic tool here. This is also a tool. That, you know, we can, this, uh, this spot is also a tool. Um, when, we handle, uh, when we handle or deal with tools, they're being discovered, that their being is discovered in terms of what he calls readiness to hand. Readiness to hand. This being as ready to hand contrasts with our just looking, for example, as you're doing now, or, uh, for example, when tools are in their packaging or up on the screen um, or in a hardware shop or an art supplies. Here, he says, they are merely presents. Emmanuel Levinas notes, it is precisely because handling, he says, precisely because handling follows, does not follow upon representation that handleability is not simply presence. And again, you start to see his critique of representation coming in here. In handling, tools are not just set before us as an object. In presence, on the other hand, entities appear as just there, as present to hand, which for you, these, that, those, that, that 
Hammer up there is merely present to hand. In his tool analysis, Heidegger cites the example of using a hammer to distinguish between knowing through handling or practical knowledge and theoretical or contemplative knowledge. And he says, and it's a quite a very famous quote, the less we just stare at this thing called the hammer and the more actively we use it, the more original our relationship becomes to it. So here comes this notion and going back to Kentridge, the more we handle it, the more original our relationship is to it. That's the, the kind of important thing. The act of hammering itself discovers the specific handiness of the hammer. No matter how keenly we just look at the outward appearance of things constituted in one way or another, we cannot discover handiness. When we just look at things theoretically, we lack an understanding of handiness. It's not that he's saying that one is better than the other. He's just saying that when we just look at something, you know, and, and that's the thing. When you look at a, a, a flat pack, you just look at it. You, can't, you don't know it any, any, any better. So we, we just, when we look at things theoretically, we lack an understanding of handiness. By association, uh, makes use of things is not blind, but the association that makes use of things is not blind. And here we come back to this idea of, of not blind. It has its own way of seeing that guides our operations and gives them this thingly quality. Four important points can be gleaned from this. Firstly, Heidegger distinguishes between observing something and using it. Secondly, he claims that in using a hammer, our relationship to it becomes more original. And that's a kind of interesting thought, particularly if you think, that, you know, in terms of from an artist and the notion of, of originality that artists so strive so hard to achieve theoretically. Um, Thirdly, he suggests we can only understand the handiness of what a thing does when we use it, deal with it practically. Finally, our use of things or practical dealing with things is not blind, but rather has its own kind of seeing or sight. Thus, Heidegger points out that when we just look at the outward appearance, it lays before us as present to hand. For him, a purely theoretical engagement with a hammer will not allow us to comprehend its being as a hammer that is its usefulness. It is through handling or using the hammer that we come to understand the nature of the hammer. Thus, it is through working with materials and the tools of practice we come to understand what material or what this, these materials, this tool or that piece of equipment can do. So when I came into here tonight, I actually had to work with and use all of the equipment here before I could actually understand, begin to, to understand what its being is. We can read software at, at manuals at, at infinitum, but it's not until we work with a particular program we understand. We encounter it as a useful thing and discover its particular qualities when we handle it in practice. This inversion of practice theory in what has become termed practice becomes central to a rethinking of the relationship between theory and practice in creativity. And for so. so on first ha reading Heidegger's tool analysis, it may be assumed that his understanding of dealing, because we deal with these tools, but on first understanding, it may be assumed that this understanding of dealing involves an instrumentalist engagement with things. And I think to some extent that... That is, is true, that, that, that you have the sort of instrumentalist. However, and particularly in, in the tool analysis and being in time, as perhaps compared to the question concerning technology, which is a, a lovely essay. However, for Heidegger, tools and materials are not simply things that get used by us. What is notable is that when we're working with our tools, working with our materials or ideas, it, we don't just use them. He's saying we don't just use them. He says it is through our concernful dealings or handling of things that the world is already discovered. And so this term concernful comes up again, emerges. So we can come back to Kentridge in thinking through this. During his art school education, Kentridge was trained to see drawing as a preliminary to the main activity of painting because of the hierarchy and the preconceptions of painting as somehow important. However, in the activity of drawing, he realised that drawing was the work of art, was the real work, was the work of art, rather than a preliminary that preceded the real work of art. 
through draw, working with charcoal, soft uh, cloth and kneadable re rubbers, possibilities emerged that had not been conceived before. So when, Heidi, uh, when um, Kentridge was working, so he, he, he drew and then he started off and he rubbed something out. And usually when people draw, make a mistake, they tear it up and throw it in the bin. However, what he started to notice as he was drawing and rubbing out, there was a trace left of the activity. And so rather than throwing it in the bin, he then saw it through handling that. He then discovered that that was an opportunity rather than a mistake that you just throw in the bin. So that in the repetitive process of drawing and rubbing out, Kentridge had to deal with the fact that the rubbing left a trace or a ghost of an image that could not be totally erased. The ghosting left a trace of the passage of time and process. It evoked time and movement. Each drawing, and that's what you see in this, in this anima in animation, that each drawing came to have the history of a sequence built into it. For Kentridge, handling or dealing with charcoal, cloth and rubber had released a new way of thinking for him. They're actually dealing with it. Rather than thinking about the problem, as he said, he, didn't think, he couldn't solve the problem through thinking. Through the do doing, it had re it released a new way of thinking. In Heideggerian terms, he'd gained, gained, he had gained an original relationship to charcoal, to the eraser, and to paper. Through such dealings, the apprehension that Kentridge gained was neither purely perceptual nor rational. Rather, the handling of tools in drawing revealed its own kind of knowledge of sight. This is the sight through which we come to know how to draw, to dance, or to write, or to cook, or to garden, or whatever. This kind of sight through which we know, come to learn how to draw, to dance, or to write, Heidegger terms circumspection. For Heidegger, it is through circumspection that the new emerges. Artistic knowledge as I said right at the beginning, is frequently characterised by notions of mastery. However, I would argue that Heidegger's notion of circumspection allows us to think in terms of skill with, perhaps rather, than mastery over our tools. And that, for me, it's important but, but broader. Artists who work in the crafts, for example, are very keenly aware of the stakes involved in practical uh, knowing. The Australian art, uh, glass artist Stephen Proctor, for example, expresses this in his working with glass. And he, he, his quote, which is lovely because it's so close to, in a sense to what Heidegger says, he says, use skill with conscious awareness. It is only when you work with your hands that you understand. Until then it is theoretical and though possible, incomprehensible. Because when the work begins and grows, it reveals something not before conceived. It is a discovery, a life and a sensibility of its own that is created through the working. A piece of work is the embodiment of thought and time. When, cutting with, with, when working with cutting to wheels, you have to work with your whole being, listening as well as looking, feeling as well as measuring, to get your eye accustomed to train it as the inner eye which gives the work its life. His observations and reflections embody the sensibility that operates in Heidegger's notion of circumspection as I understand it. Proctor continues his reflections by observing how working with glass, as with other materials, requires us to be attentive and sensitive to materials rather than just using them as a means to end, actually being attentive and sensitive to them. It is through our concernful dealings with our material that something never before conceived is revealed. This is where our theoretical understandings gain, go out of practice. What do these observations and, and indeed Heidegger's conception mean for our understanding of the new? According to the theories of avant-garde, which perhaps may not be necessarily totally popular these days, the shock of the new has been figured as a transgressive, as transgressive, an attempt to break existing rules and usher in the new. The relentless quest for the new that drives avant-garde art practice has continued in contemporary practice despite postmodern critique of avant-garde and originality. So in, in the arts they would, would say there's no such thing as originality. However, Heidegger says that humans do not have any control over unconcealment. Heidegger tells us that unconcealment of the new is never human handiwork claiming that the thinker only responded to what was addressed to him, and that comes from the question concerning technology. Thus, by definition, the new cannot be preconceived, and in the face of seemingly limitless possibilities, 
Practice cannot know or preconceive its outcome. According to Heidegger, then, the new, can, the new emerges through the process as a shadow that presents itself to us. The danger of representational thinking, he says, is that when we hold before us an idea of what we are thinking we are making, and, and if you think what we think we are making, we may not be open to what the work may address to us, and this whole idea of the work addressing to us. The work speaks. In, in, the, uh, in the origin of the work of art, he talks about the work speaks, and we have to listen to the work. But when we are carrying around our preconceptions, as when you arrived here tonight, we so, may be so busy looking elsewhere, that is, to our preconceptions, that we can miss it altogether. This preconception closes off possibility rather than making us, allowing us to be open to what may be unconcealed through the work of art or be unconcealed in, 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 as being. Thus, no matter how hard we try to think and create their new, our conscious efforts will not succeed. Here we can return to Heidegger's claim that it is through circumspection that the new uh, emerges. I would suggest that the shock of the new is a particular understanding that is realised through our dealings with tools and materials. In the work of art, we do not consciously seek the new, but rather to open to what emerges in, in the interaction with materials and processes. Thus, it is only through use that we gain access to the world and establish original relationship with it. And in that, Emmanuel Levinas uh, observes that through these material dealings, we gain the access to the world in an original and an original way. Faced with what is thrown up, and we go back to that old idea, we're thrown into the world, and we're faced with what, thrown, with what is thrown up, um, we seize possibility in its very possibility. This way of being thrown towards one's own possibilities is, as Heidegger argues, a crucial moment of understanding. Now, when Heidegger talks about understanding, he's not referring to understanding as a cognitive faculty because we tend to see understanding as somehow a cognitive faculty. But he says, no, it is not a cognitive faculty that is imposed on existence. He says, understanding is the care that comes from handling, of being in the world and dealing with things. This relation of care is not a relationship of the knowing subject and an object known. We care because we have an investment in things. So far, I have argued that through handleability, the handle, that rather than conscious, through handleability rather than conscious attempts to create the new, original and originary effects. Sorry, rather rather than any conscious attempts to create the new. Original and originary effects and meanings emerge. Art can be seen to emerge in the involvement with materials, methods, tools and ideas of practice. It is not a representation of an already formed idea. In this matrix, engagement with tools or technology has its own kind of sight. And so just as, as Heidegger discovered the potential of charcoal and erasers by working with them, it is not until when I'm a painting, it's not until I begin to work to, to work with my paints um, and lay down colour that I can understand what it is that emerges. Yeah. In re relocating our interests as care, we can once again address the question of art practice. In seeing this way, Kentridge's charcoal and eraser are not just used. The subject matter is not just present at hand, nor is the artwork merely an end but rather an opening. Handling as care produces a crucial moment of understanding and that understanding is revealing, in its very is a revealing in its very possibility. So this notion of revealing, which of course is, is central to the, to the uh, origin of the work of art, this, this revealing of possibility, this, not the completed artwork, the thing that we see as an artwork, is the work of art. And so that distinction that Heidegger makes between artwork and the work of art is a very kind of critical one. Uh, and the artwork itself is not the work of art. So commenters, and, and now coming to drawing to a close, commentators have focused on Heidegger's pe pessimistic prognosis of technological revealing. And certainly the question of concerning technology is very, very pessimistic. But I would argue that they have tended to overlook the radicality of his refiguration of the human-tool relation. 
I would like to suggest that his thinking challenges our current understanding of, of the, not just the artistic relation, but broadly the human relations with technology and with the world and enables a shift from an instrumentalist use of materials towards a notion of, of handleability and concernful dealings. It offers a different way of thinking about our relations with our tools and materials, a way of thinking that, for me, ushers in an ethical understanding of practice. Now, the mere mention of an ethical understanding of practice brings us finally to the vexed question of Heidegger's own life practices. Heidegger's personal history, in particular his role as an academic at Freiburg University in Germany in the interwar period where he became caught up in the fervour of national socialism, nationalist socialism, national socialism, cannot be ignored. Being aware of this history makes it impossible to address his writings and thinkings without, link, without acknowledging his links to, to Nazism. His, uh, without acknowledging his, his links to Nazism, his lack of insight into the potentials of National Socialism and his failure to acknowledge his own complicity with the National Socialist regime in Germany in the 1930s. Certainly there have been many scholars who feel Heidegger's complicity with Nazism cannot be overcome and as a consequence refuse to engage with his work. Other scholars, however, point out that Heidegger's thinking of the question of Dasein being in the world mirrors his own fallenness as a human being. He succumbed to the pressures of the they, even as he struggled in his intellectual work to focus on the question of being. This mismatch between Heidegger's fallenness in everyday life and his philosophical quest provides, I think, important questions for us all. His philosophy as being is in many ways a self-portrait, his philosophy of being is in many ways, I would argue, a self-portrait of his struggle to address the question of being, big B being, even as he lived out his life as a human being. In this sense, it could be argued that this is precisely why we actually do need to study Heidegger's writings rather than avoid them. It is this portrait of human fallibility that in a sense makes his work compelling for us as mere mortal beings. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.